So today we've got a speaker all the way from the University of the Free State. Uh, her name is Anneri Mankis and she is a researcher in the Center for Teaching and Learning at the University of the Free State, uh, uh, as I've said. And her main responsibilities include promoting the effective use of online assessment through evidence-based tests, uh, best practice, monitoring staff uh, and student engagement with the institutional learning management system. Uh, they're using Blackboard over there, as well as their digital identities and investigating the optimization of blended learning uh, to the University of the Free State. She's worked in the field of assessment and particularly online assessment since 2014. And she's actually currently, uh, she's enrolled for a PhD, which is also on online assessment. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to, okay, before I hand over to Anari, I just want to mention that I will be recording, um, well, you can ask your questions. If you have any questions, please uh, write them in the text chat area. Um, and then I'll be collecting them from the chat and we're going to be um, sharing it with Anari at the end. Okay, so over to you, Anari. Ah, thank you very much for the introduction, Nicola um, and um, Jakob. I am going to not introduce myself again, so I'm just going to get started. Um, this seminar is on building student learning muscle with online assessment. So just to give an overview of what I'll be covering in the seminar today, do a brief introduction, um, then move over to assessment practices that promote learning. And then um, the bulk of the presentation will be about strategies for designing questions that test higher order thinking. And then I'll end off with some practical advice for dealing with online assessment challenges in the African context. So um, first off, just to kind of frame the discussion a bit, when, when I talk about online assessment in this specific um, presentation, I'm uh, it also actually uh, a better term for it probably would have been e-assessment because it's not necessarily um, all the tools and all the practical examples that I'm going to share would not necessarily need um, a, a student to be online for the duration of the assessment, but for at least part of the assessment or part of the assessment procedure, a student will need an electronic device and access to the internet. Um, and then uh, one of the reasons why online assessment has been, uh, or the need for online assessment has been, um, has increased over the last few years specifically is because in, in our context, we have very large classes. And with large classes, there's a lot of um, uh, challenges in terms of assessment specifically. So uh, just thinking about giving feedback, for instance, to a thousand plus students is really hard. Giving individualized feedback, for instance, is really hard. Um, and online assessment um, can help with that. Another thing that, another challenge with large classes in assessment is, for instance, that um, you, you might not be able to do regular assessment activities if you have to grade, physically grade all the assessment activities. But with online assessment, there are many different opportunities and affordances to actually um, do assessment that is automatically marked. So my experience is mostly in a contact-based um, institution, but um, some of the, the examples that I'll share, and I think most of the examples that I'll share will actually also be relevant or might, um, you know, relevant in a distance environment. Um, then my, a lot of the examples and resources that I'll share with you today um, can be found on that website link that I'm sharing with you here, www.blendedlearningresources.ca.za. Um, you'll find the online assessment resources tab um, at the top there and, and uh, much of what I'll be discussing today will also be, is also available there. So um, Nicola already mentioned about the questions. So um, I'm going to, to finish the presentation a bit earlier so that we do have some time to address um, the questions. All right, so in terms of framing the, the discussion, um, what do I mean with assessment for learning? The whole uh, theme of this or the title of this presentation is about how to build student learning muscle. And when we talk about assessment for learning, um, I like this uh, definition from Schoenfeld, 
performance opportunities, uh, it's performance opportunities, the primary purpose of which is to provide students and teachers with feedback about the student's current state while there are still opportunities for improvement. And that I think is a very key part of assessment for learning. So just to unpack it a little bit more, um, the purpose of assessment for learning and using assessment activities to enhance learning is to provide instructors and students with continuous feedback throughout the course. Um, usually an assessment for learning is low stakes assessments. It can be smaller assessment activities, um, non-threatening assessment activities, and it can also be used to help students to to prepare for, for the summative assessment. Um, what is important in all types of assessment, uh, not just assessment for learning, however, is that all assessment activities should be linked to learning outcomes and learning activities. So I often get, when I present training on online assessment and the different possibilities, that people sometimes get very excited about what the possibilities are of, with online assessment and then um, want to try different things in their um, teaching and learning, but that it doesn't always necessarily make sense um, in, the, in, the, in the course as a whole. So it's really important that online assessment should also be um, integrated with the, rest of the, with the rest of the course by linking it uh, clearly to outcomes and learning activities. So the specific online um, assessment activities that Oopsie, sorry, that I want to focus on today um, that I'm going to give some practical examples of is um, online tests, journals, and assignments. Okay, so I think most people who, uh, most people are familiar with a quiz, with a quiz tool. Um, it's, I know different universities make use of different learning management systems, but the one of the most well-known um, online assessment activities is a, is a quiz. So that's usually uh, multiple choice type questions and then you usually get, um, and then there's fixed responses, students select an answer and they get the response, their results immediately and it's automatically marked. But when we use an online assessment tool like a quiz for assessment, uh, for, for learning, there are different ways to do that. So one way is to do class preparation quizzes. So to have students go through the content difficult, it's basically just to get students to go through the content and to, to kind of force them to, to go through the content and prepare for class. So that's one way that you can use um, uh, online assessment for learning. Another way is to do an online practical quiz. So this would be something that you typically do after a lecture or after um, uh, discussing content with students, you can develop um, specific application type questions. And this is where the skills to design questions that are more application based and not necessarily um, on the lower levels of Bloom come in. Um, so to develop practical questions, application type questions um, that students complete um, after attending a class based on the content that was covered. Um, and these questions are usually linked to real life scenarios um, to help students to link the, the theoretical content to a practical environment. And you can use online quizzes for that. Um, another way that, that I've seen um, people use online quizzes, quite a, a good example of using online quizzes is um, through a question bank. So a question bank would be um, a large bank of questions that, that consist of more questions that you, than you're actually going to ask in the test. So let's say you've got about 100 questions, but you only want students to answer 10 of them. Um, usually people don't just have question banks lying around. Um, uh, it, it takes a long time to build a question bank over time. Um, so one way would be to build it over time and another way would be um, sometimes publisher resources also provide uh, banks of questions. So one way to use that then is to open up an assessment for students uh, a week or so before a, a big summative assessment like a written semester test or something like that um, and give students two or three opportunities to to do these assessments and um, very short maybe um, 
as an example, if you're covering chapter one, two, and three in your summative assessment, um, and you have about 100 questions for each of those chapters in your in your bank, um, you can have students answer 10 questions of each at, or so that you get to a total of 30 questions and get, give students two or three opportunities to actually practice um, for the test before the test, um, kind of test themselves before the before the summative test. So I just also want to mention here, it's good practice to then also put a time limit on that so the students can get the experience of a real um, uh, high stakes environment as well. Then another very good example of um, online quizzes that you can use, and this doesn't necessarily have to be with a quiz tool on the LMS. It can be with a survey tool as well. If your if your quiz tool um, doesn't have the functionality for this example that this example um, shows, but it basically. Um, this type of, of quiz means that students will see a, a question and based on their answer, they will see the next question. So it's a rooted questions based on their answer. So if they get the question wrong, they'll see, they'll get feedback that explains to them, this is not the right answer. Go back to this chapter in your textbook and try the question again. So that's one way to do it. If your LMS or the quiz tool that you use um, do not have that functionality to kind of force students to go back and back to questions before they can submit, you can also set up a regular quiz with proper feedback, feedback for each individual item. So then let's say the correct answer is A. Um, then if students select B, C, or D, or they selected B, C, or D, when they submit their assessment at the end, they get feedback um, and they see all the proper feedback for each question and why they got the question wrong. And then you maybe give them a second attempt to do the test um, and see if they, if they can then get um, the questions right. So just to show you what this looks like um, practically, on the left-hand side, the example quiz question would be, it's an accounting question. Um, you own a small business, you sold goods of 50 Rand on credit. After all, if it's to collect the money from the customer failed, how will you document this in, in the general ledger? And then there's some answers there. C is not the correct answer, but if students have selected C, the quest, they'll get the feedback on the right that says something like, remember that if you were not able to collect the amount owed by a customer who made a purchase on credit, you need to write it off as bad debt have a look at chapter three in your textbook, um, you know, um, something like that. So that's another very good way to use, um, to make sure that you use feedback very well to enhance student learning with assessment. Uh, a last example of a quiz that I'm just quickly going to show you is to use a quiz. Again, you can use a survey tool for this. Um, it is in effect actually a survey um, to kind of, to get students to reflect on quizzes that they've come uh, to reflect on assessments that they've completed. So this is usually after a, a summative assessment, um, something like a formal semester test, uh, you give them this quiz. So the instructions would be that they would need their graded assessment with them. It can be a paper-based assessment that they completed, usually will be. Um, they go through, through each question, for instance, the instructions here is question one is what mark did you obtain for question one in the test? So theoretically uh, or hypothetically, the question one in this test counted 15 marks. So students have to now select either they got, they obtained between zero and seven marks out of 15 for the test. So that means they got less than 50% or between eight and 11. Um, they passed the, the question, but they didn't get um, a distinction or they got a distinction if they got between 12 and 15. So then they select how they performed in the, in the test. If students, for instance, fail the specific question, it's question by question. If they, if they fail the first question, they'll get um, rooted question, uh, follow-up questions. So uh, they would get these questions, for instance, you failed the question, why do you think you did not pass this question in the test? Um, and then you can have options like, I ran out of time, I did not do all my homework, I missed some classes, et cetera, et cetera. You can add options that are relevant to your context or your con um, module. And then another question might be, what will you do to ensure that you pass similar, uh, a similar question in the future? You may select more than one option. I'll do my homework. I'll make an appointment with my lecturer. I'll invest more time. Um, and then an open-ended question, what can your lecturer do differently to help you succeed in the future? This is just an example, but it, it forces then students to, to reflect on their performance in each different section of the test and 
section of the work basically that they struggled with. Um, an example of questions that you can ask students who pass the question, uh, the specific question in the test, how do you feel about your marks? Um, are you satisfied? Do you think you could have done better? Um, why did you lose some marks in this question? And then again, some options there. Or if they passed with distinction, you can say, well done on obtaining a uh, distinction. Um, why do you think you did so well? So kind of reflecting on, I did really well in question one. I wonder, um, why did I do so well? It's because I understood the specific section of the work very well, because I did my homework, I attended class, or, you know, different types of options there. So this is, is not necessarily a quiz in the traditional sense of the word, although you can use the quiz tool on your LMS, or like I mentioned, the survey tool to help students to reflect on their performance, but it also provides feedback to you as the instructor on what students um, are struggling with. Uh, another way to use online assessment for learning would be a journal. I think most of you'd probably be familiar with a journal, so I'm not going to um, spend too much time introducing the, the tool, but it's usually an individual activity that you do with your students. Um, it's really important if you do ask students to journal or reflect on their learning experiences that it's again clearly linked to outcomes and teaching activities. The purpose of the assessment should be clear to students and to yourself. Um, and you can consider doing more than one reflection over the duration of a course. So for instance, if you're teaching something like a research methodology course, you can maybe in the beginning of the module, when the course starts, ask students to do a short reflection on what they think research means, um, why they think research is important in the real world, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can, towards the end of the semester, again, ask them to reflect on exactly the same questions that they've reflected on in the beginning. But, um, and then you can, you and the students can see how their um, views maybe have transformed or changed um, throughout, the, throughout the course. Uh, you can grade rubrics with, a, uh, great journals with a rubric, but make sure that you make it available to students prior to the assessment. Um, rubrics can be, ugh, journals can be very tough to, to grade if there were not very clear instructions before the time, before the actual activity. So um, it's really difficult for students to to reflect on something if, if, if you don't guide them a little bit. So for instance, if you ask a question like reflect on your experience of the module, it's a really vague question. So I'd always suggest that you ask some guiding questions. Uh, what did you find difficult in this um, section of the work? What did you enjoy? What did you learn about X, Y, Z? Very specific questions. And then also limit, um, limit their work, word count um, and make sure that they know how long their reflection should be. So I'm just going to show you an example here from um, a article that I got from a, um, it's engineering education article. It's, it's sometimes much easier for people who are in the social sciences to, to um, think of ways to use a journaling activity and sometimes um, or, or not so prevalent in the natural sciences, for instance, but this was an example from an article um, like I mentioned in engineering, and this lecturer asked students to, she prompted students throughout the semester. First, in the first class, um, she prompted them by asking, uh, what is an application of thin fluid flow on a, on a solid that you might have seen at home or on campus? How thick do you think the layer was? So this is kind of asking them to reflect on the content or the theory that they've learned in class, trying to link it to real life examples um, through reflection activities. So. Um, so there's definitely different ways in which you can use journaling um, as an assessment tool um, for learning. Assignments, I think, again, most people would be familiar with, with assignments, and it's not an uncommon uh, assessment type. But online assessment also, again, brings with it some a variety of different ways to, to use assignments. So you can, um, when, we have, when you have a large class, um, a group assignment is always a, an option to reduce marking, but also to get students to collaborate and work in teams. Um, again, most people, uh, the, the main difference between an online assignment, using an assignment as an online assessment tool and using it as a regular uh, or traditional written assessment tool would basically be in the way that it's submitted. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a regular written assignment would be something that students print out and deliver to the lecturer's office or 
hand in in class, where an online assignment would be something that you, instead of printing it out and taking it to the lecture, you submit it on a Dropbox or a space on a, a learning management system, or sometimes even just email the lecturer with it. Um, but that's basically a big difference <clears throat> between the two. And but having an assignment submitted online does um, bring with it uh, some advantages like the uh, possibility to mark the assignment with an online rubric, especially if it's integrated in the LMS, that does save a lot of time and allows you to give um, feedback online and, and do the whole process online. Again, it's important that there's clear instructions for students for different activities. So in addition to traditional written assignments that I've talked about now, other ways that you can ask students to submit an assignment, either as an individual or in a group, would be to ask them to submit a poster or an infographic that, they, that they've created using free software, um, to ask them to, to make a short PowerPoint presentation with a voiceover, submit that as an assignment, to ask them to submit a short audio file as a, like a podcast, um, ask them to make a short video. I've seen very good examples of, um, of people using videos as an assignment, um, students having to submit like a three minute video uh, at the end of a semester that was more of a, a type of a summative assessment, but it, it's definitely, um, it, it comes with a lot of advantages um, because students learn how to use, oh, st students develop their digital skills, they, they use free software and um, they can be very creative and, and it really um, adds to the variety of assessment opportunities available. Another way, um, for instance, is to ask them to submit an annotated bibliography before they start with research to kind of scaffold a larger project into smaller um, pieces and have them submit separate um, smaller assignments. So this is just some examples of, of how of the possibilities with, with online assignments. Um, I just quickly want to mention that um, as part of, apart from the, the lecturer providing feedback to the students, it's really useful and there's a lot of rich literature on um, the benefits of self and peer assessment, but this is an example of a, a self and peer assessment rubric from Carnegie Mellon University and I've put the link there at the bottom of the slide um, if, you, if you want to download this yourself, but this is um, this type of rubric requires the student to evaluate both themselves um, and their peers. So uh, three would be that um, the person that, they evaluate, that they're evaluating were better than most in the group for the specific aspect. Two would be about average for the group. Uh, one would be not as good as most in the group and zero would be no help at all. So then they look at different aspects of not only the actual product, the assessment product that they delivered, but also the process of completing the assessment like group participation, time management, adaptability, creativity. And they have to think and reflect on their own performance in relation to the rest of the group, as well as their peers individually in relation to the rest of the bigger group. So this is a very useful um, as tool to include in, in assignments or group assignments. There are more examples um, of ways that you can um, use different online assessment tools and different online assessment activities on the website. Um, I'm going, as I mentioned, I'm referring a lot to the website in the presentation, but the specific link to the methods and implementation ideas are also at the bottom of the screen there. I'm going to move over to designing questions to test cognitive skills beyond recall and understanding. And I, I think this is a very important part of if, if you want to use online assessment for learning and if you want to, to use quizzes and things like that and multiple choice questions, it's really important that, um, that you're able to design a good question and a question that tests skills or um, higher order thinking skills. But the trick is also to design objective questions um, that test these skills. So it's not just a, a regular question, an open-ended question, but objective questions. So when I talk about objective questions, these are the questions that, the question types that are usually included in quiz tools that are automatically marked by a system. 
And the reason, one of the big reasons why people want to make use of online assessment is because it reduces the marking load, specifically in large classes, and it allows you to do more regular assessment. So if the main reason why you want to use online assessment in your module is to reduce your marking load, it is important then that you understand that you need to make use of objective assessment types um, because those are marked automatically. So objective question types would be questions with fixed responses. Examples would be a multiple choice question that I think most people are familiar with. Then multiple response questions, which is exactly like a multiple choice question, but with where the student selects more than one answer. And then matching questions, which is like a traditional column A, column B type of uh, question where students have to match one side of the, one column with the other column. Um, and then some quiz tools also provide options for hotspots, numeric questions, and other a wide variety of different types. But the examples I'm going to focus on today would be um, the first three, multiple choice, multiple response, and matching questions, and how to design questions that test higher order thinking um, for those three types. So um, I'm hoping that some parts of this presentation would be useful not only for lecturers who actually teach, um, but also for academic developers or people who work in staff development. And if you, if you teach your own course, then obviously you can use your own content to develop these questions based on the strategies that I'm going to share with you now. But if you're an academic developer and you don't necessarily have specific content to work with, um, I usually just make sure that I get a, a reading piece. And for this specific presentation, I've used a, a Wikipedia page on globalization. So usually it would be a generic topic that you don't need too much discipline knowledge in to be able to use as an example. Um, and I use this in, when, I, when I present training as well, um, just a, a reading piece that is a, a generic, that has a generic topic so that, um, so that the examples can, so that, the strat, so that I can show the examples through the strategies. So the first strategy to design a question that tests higher order thinking um, would be a scaffolded multiple choice question. And this is also called a uh, two tier multiple choice question sometimes. So it basically consists of a question and then options, one of which is correct. So you'll see the first half of that is a regular multiple choice question. Usually that question is on a lower level of bloom. So it only requires remembering, for instance. But then the second part of the question um, consists of a second set of options where you have to give a reason for your answer. So, um, and usually that question then builds on the, the first part of the question. So this is a, an example that's also on the website, just to illustrate. We have, um, for instance, the first part of the question, suppose you're given a, uh, two clay balls of equal size and shape. The two clay balls weigh the same. One ball is flattened into a pancake shaped piece. Which of these statements is correct? Uh, the pancake shaped piece weighs more. The two pieces weigh the same. The ball weighs more. So then this is already a question on its own, but this is not the question that the student answers. The second part of the question now requires students to, to give a reason for why they chose the first the first. Um, answer. And this is where they are required to do a little bit more than just remember. Um, they have to, to build on their understanding of the first part of the question. So this is a really um, simple example. I'll show you an example now from the globalization reading piece. So I understand that um, the participants of this session haven't read through the globalization uh, Wikipedia page, but um, this session is also recorded. So if you want to um, go through this again at, at the end, um, read through the Wikipedia page and then again, look at these questions that might also um, be useful. But from the Wikipedia page, I got this from as, a, as content now, um, I developed this question, the original question. One of the supporting views of globalization is the idea that there is a social contract between all global citizens and that of people from all countries should become more integrated and aware of common interests and shared morality and humanity. This is an example of, and then there are four options. So if, um, if you read through the Wikipedia page, you'll actually see that this description of a supporting view of globalization is 
exactly like this on the on the Wikipedia page. So if my students had to study that Wikipedia page as content, the answer would be very clear from the list um, as B. But to use this scaffolded multiple choice strategy now, um, I'm still including the first part of the question, but now I'm asking a follow-up question. Which of the following statements best explains why this is a positive notion? So it's not just now remembering what are all the supporting views of globalization again? This actually requires you now to explain why you chose the answer that you chose um, in the first place. So this um, scaffolded multiple choice question is basically two questions in one, one part building on another. Another strategy, and this is a, a strategy that um, is probably one of the easiest ways to make sure that you uh, require a bit more from students than just remembering or understanding, is to to incorporate a real world scenario. So this basically um, is a, you give them a scenario that you've either compiled yourself or you can get, a, get it from a case study that you've got from the internet or something. And then you ask a question or a series of questions based on the scenario and you require them to link the theory to the scenario. So that at the very least is already um, on an application level. And, and it's an easy way to, to make questions a bit more demanding. Um, the example that I'm sharing with you here is um, from the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. It's this whole scenario of um, you are a correctional officer and you are assigned to the supply warehouse. You're responsible for offenders who work in the warehouse. Um, there are other non-correctional employees who also work in the warehouse. One day you notice that an employee who has only worked there for two days returns from his lunch hour and sneaks what appears to be a bag of food from a local fast food place to an offender. Which of the follow, uh, which of below statements is the least preferred action to take? So you see, it's you might be a student might have studied the theory, but this requires an application of the theory to an actual scenario. So to just give you an example again of the globalization content, um, a very simple question would have been, which of the below is a common criticism of globalization? So again, in the content, there's a list of different criticisms of, of globalization and you would have easily been able to answer this question. But if you transform this into a scenario-based question, I'm not going to read through this whole scenario, but basically the scenario was, um, I got this from the Washington Post. Uh, it's a case study from, uh, it's an actual uh, newspaper article. So it's about how people in Bolivia are struggling to sell goods um, and to compete globally by, se uh, by selling their goods because of the... Um, because of other uh, uh, goods that are sold much cheaper by, by Chinese companies, et cetera. So then there's this whole scenario about that. And then the question is, which common criticism of globalization does the above case study illustrate? And this question is much more um, challenging to answer than to just kind of think of the list of criticisms in your mind and remember which ones are um, on the list. So real world scenario is another strategy to to make the questions a bit more demanding. I'm going to show you here an example of a matching question also by using scenarios. So one way that a matching question can be used um, with most online quiz tools have this um, as an option is to have very short scenarios on the left hand side and to have your answers on the right hand side but to also have a couple of extra answers at the bottom ugh, on the right hand side so for instance in this example there's a very short scenario when i was your age we had to do our shopping before sunday nothing was open on a sunday now you can buy your milk and bread in the pick and pay oh my goodness um you can buy your milk and pick but uh at the pick and pay around the corner until nine every day, including weekends. And this is an example of consumerism. So, um, you know, and then there's also some other options at the bottom. Sorry, let me just quickly get my um, power. Okay. So um, the second one there, we should outsource the call center function to company X that operates from Indonesia. The quotations I've received were much cheaper than the wages we'd have to pay in South Africa, uh, South African laborers. This is unrestricted fair trade. So then you have a little scenario for each different option on the right. And this it makes it a bit more demanding than just using the actual descriptions from the content or from the textbook. 
The last strategy that I'm going to share with you today is multi-logic thinking. So this is where you have a scenario, you have a question, and then you have a second scenario. It's, it's, almost, it's similar to the scaffolded multiple choice, but where the scaffolded multiple choice is an easy question and the difficult question that builds on that. Um, the multi-logic question is basically two different scenarios that you need to keep in mind and the, you need to understand the one before you can actually answer the other one. So just to give you an example, um, Tim's second grade teacher is concerned because of the following observations about Tim's behavior in class. He withdraw, withdraws from his peers on the playground. During group work, he confuses syllables. Uh, he loses his place when reading, etc. So this first part of the question, yeah, um, it, the first scenario already requires the student to make a diagnosis based on the symptoms, which is an application question. But then, the second part of the question is, and this is the actual question that I have to answer, the teacher has arranged a meeting with Tim's mother to discuss these concerns. Which of the following statements is best for the teacher to say to Tim's mother? Uh, the second part of the question requires the students now to evaluate the best course of action. Um, you need to first do the diagnosis, the diagnosis before you can uh, evaluate the course of action, but it's not the same as an easy question, um, a difficult question building on an easy question as a follow-up. So just to give you another example of multi-logic thinking, um, again, I've used the original question that I've also used with the scaffolded multiple choice question where I'm, give, I'm describing one of the um, supporting views of globalization and then asking the students what this is an example of. So I'm still keeping that part of the question, but the the second part of the question is, despite the potential that this notion holds for society at large, what would be an opposing detrimental effect associated with it? So this is requiring students to really think about, okay, so this is, global civics is, um, is a positive aspect of globalization because A, B, C, and D, but what would be the opposite of that? And what would, what would be a potential threat and this is not something that they'd find in the in the actual textbook um and they really have to think about and really understand and apply what they've learned to be able to to do that there is a fourth strategy on the website as well um analysis of visuals of using pictures and graphs and things like that um but you can have a look at that on the website itself um so i'm just going to end off with some common online assessment challenges in our context and some practical advice for addressing them um, before I'm going to take some questions. So there are more than this, but the three main challenges is that we have our students we don't have equal act, our students don't have equal internet access or access to devices. So many of our students do not have reliable internet at home. At the University of the Free State, we did a study in 2018 that we're actually repeating now in 2020. But in 2018, 21% of our students have access to reliable internet at home. So 79% of our students do not have reliable internet access at home. And this is really important to know when you plan online assessment activities because we are limited in what we can expect from our students when the reality is that they are gonna have to make another plan to, to get internet access. So um, if we use online, and this is also the reason why this whole presentation was about online assessment activities for learning. It's not as, I didn't really, I didn't talk about online assessment um, in, in a summative environment or a um, very formal online assessment. All of these activities that I've shared now was to uh, enhance learning and it's more formative in nature. Um, and for those, it's, it's not, the, the restrictions in terms of internet access does not have to be completely detrimental. So one of the things that you can do is to make sure that you give students enough time to complete the assessment. Um, but there's a difference between a time limit and availability period. So I would usually suggest that you at least keep an assessment open available for about a week. Um, so students should be able to access the assessment or the assessment instructions for at least 
at least a week. And that allows students then within that week to make sure that they do make a, um, arrangements to get to either a computer lab on campus or either a space that has free Wi-Fi um, to be able to do this assessment. By forcing them to do an assessment for, on Tuesday from 12 o'clock to 12.30 is really restrictive and doesn't work in, in this type of environment with this type of reality. Um, but what is also important is that once they do open the assessment anytime during that week, that there is a time limit on the actual assessment. So while assessment might be open for a week, if they open the assessment, they might have a time limit of 30 minutes. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this now when, when I address cheating as well. So that is the second thing that a lot of people are worried about when they make use of online assessment. And one of the biggest concerns um, among lecturers who, who are interested in using online assessment but um, are worried about um, some of the challenges and, and one of the biggest ones is cheating. So I often get the question, how do I... Um, ensure that my student that the student who's supposed to complete the assessment completes the assessment or how do I ensure that the students don't help each other to complete the assessment um, the short answer for that is there's no way for you to, to to ensure that if the if the assessment is not proctored um, then or it's, it's not invigilated in some way then there's no way for you to ensure that students aren't going to work together but there are things that you can put in place to limit cheating. Um, and one of the best ways to do it is a proper time limit. So I, I've often seen, and it, it, it's, it's really interesting, I often see people um, who want to use online assessment for the first time are very lenient with their time limit. So you might ask 10 multiple choice questions and you give students an hour for the test, which is way too much time. Um, so if you limit, if you have a proper time limit on your assessment and it's communicated clearly to students beforehand that they will only have 10 minutes to complete an assessment, for instance, then they don't really have time to kind of take pictures, discuss the questions, Google the answers, whatever, um, if, if they only have 10 minutes to complete it and if it's a proper time limit. Obviously, you shouldn't be unreasonable but if there's a proper time limit that does limit cheating but a very important way to limit cheating is the test design so some of the examples I've shared with you now is designing questions that in such a way that students won't be able to get the answers from Google or get the answers from their textbooks on page 18 for instance by asking application based questions scenario questions and the examples that I've given now that requires students to really think about the question and um, and that also limits the possibility for cheating. But what you should also ask yourself actually first is whether student collaboration is really a deal breaker. If the purpose of assessment for learning is for students to learn, um, is it really preventing them from learning if they do collaborate with each other or when they complete the assessments? If the answer is yes, I really do not want my students to collaborate when they complete this assessment, then maybe online assessment, this type of online assessment, is not the best way for you to assess your students in this specific instance. Um, but I, I firmly believe that in most cases, if you want to use these online assessment activities for learning, it, it isn't a deal breaker if students collaborate. And then lastly, when it comes to dealing with student queries, so this is not necessarily a uh, challenge in by itself. Uh, with regular written assessments, you'll also have student queries, and that's not necessarily a problem. But the issue with online assessment is that you'll get different types of queries and additional types of queries, like technical issues. Um, the queries that you get might not be, why is question one not marked correctly? It might be something like, I, my computer froze while I was busy writing, uh, completing the test. I accidentally pressed the submit button before I was finished. I accidentally opened the wrong assessment um, and completed the wrong assessment. Load shedding. So all of these things are actually um, are different types of queries that you get, that you now get when you start using online assessment for the first time. But luckily, there are also ways to limit that. And one of the best ways is, and really most important, is to be transparent. Make sure that the students understand the purpose of the assessment. Make sure that they understand what will be expected of them. And make sure that they understand the criteria. 
So it's really important that before you do an online assessment that students know, I'm going to have a week to complete this test. When I open this test, it's going to have a time limit of 30 minutes. Um, it's going to consist mostly of multiple choice type questions. It's going to count 30 marks. Um, it's going to be about chapter one to three in the book. I'm, I have to prepare like I prepare for a regular test before I open the assessment. Things like that. It, you need to communicate clearly to students. And then another a way to reduce queries notably is to have clear rules that you communicate in advance and that you apply consistently. Now this, it, I don't really like saying this because it sounds very autocratic and but with, an, with online assessment, especially in large classes, if you don't have some rules and some ground rules um, and you're not strict about it, it can be overwhelming to have to deal with the queries. So some of the rules, for instance, that we have is that if students click on the submit button to submit the test, whether that was accidental or not, they don't get a second opportunity to, um, to do the test. If the time limit expired for whatever reason, they don't get a second opportunity. If they accidentally open the wrong test, they don't get a second opportunity. So things like that are communicated to them beforehand. And then when you do get instances like that where students may have accidentally clicked submit, it's really important in your behavior that you're consistent because what you do for the one student, you need to do for the other student. So, um, if you have clear rules, you communicate it beforehand and you apply it consistently, it will reduce queries significantly. Um, a, more positive way, a more positive way to limit queries would be to allow students to do a practice test beforehand. This is especially useful for first year, first semester students. For those of you who, are, who teach first year, first semester students, Many of our students aren't prepared to use technology and many of our students first encounter with a computer or computer based assessment is actually at university level. So it is part of our, it's part of their learning experience and a part of the teaching experience to prepare students for using the tools. Um, and we have, for instance, generic practice tests like that has questions that's not at all discipline specific, but something like, what year was the bikini invented? A multiple choice question like that. And we, we share that with lecturers and lecturers can use that um, as a practice test for their students. And then usually you would open up a practice test about a week or so before the actual test opens and allow students to complete those assessments to, to see exactly what the, it would be like to complete the actual assessment for the first time. And then obviously also to have some um, how-to documents and videos is also very helpful to, to kind of use a more proactive way of, of minimizing your queries rather than a reactive way of dealing with it. So these are just three of the major challenges. Um, I'm also, um, there's also more a comprehensive discussion on dealing with online assessment challenges in the South African or African context on the website. So yeah, that's actually all from my side. So I think there's um, some time for questions, Nicola, um, if you want to maybe um, get us started. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Anneli. That was really, um, you know, really useful. And I want to remind folks that we've got a little survey. So if you want to complete this, it's just feedback to the presenter um, and also for, for uh, the Emerge Africa Network about the usefulness of this webinar. And I'm going to put the link in the text chat. So please complete um, that survey for us. The other thing is the link to the website that Annelies mentioned. So while it is in our um, on the event uh, information page. I thought I'd also put that into the text chat and you can go and check it out. Okay, so there are loads of resources on online assessment that will be very helpful. So back to the question. So Neil had an interesting one. He asked about a practical uh, quiz. So he says on the online uh, practical quiz, he says, I know it's very difficult to create these type of practical or application questions. Uh, what would your guidelines or best practices, are there some, sorry, are there some guidelines that you would share? And maybe the real world scenario uh, answers that you sh talked about, maybe that discusses, uh, 
um, sort of answer some of that. But if you have any guidelines for creating questions, for quizzes, uh, for practical application questions. Um, yeah, I think that uh, it's really true that, that, that those types of questions are really hard to, to design. Um, but I'm hoping that some of the strategies that I shared in the second part of the presentation will help with that. Um, and then also on the, on the blended learning resources website, um, I think the, under the online assessment resources section, there is a specific section, again, that describes the strategies for developing higher order thinking questions. There there's one of the strategies that I didn't mention in today's presentation about using um, uh, visuals like images and um, even a cartoon or something that illustrates uh, part of the theory. It's one way to also do it. But I think the real world scenarios um, is probably one that's the one of the easier ways to, to, to get started with those types of questions. Awesome. Thank you. And then Hima, Hima, I think you say, I, I think you asked, I pronounced your, your name as Hima, uh, said, I had a question around when students get the answer correct. And in actual fact, they might have just have guessed. Um, <laughs> so they ask, should the feedback not be applicable to students who get the correct answer? Yeah, Sorry. Cool. <laughs> well, that's a good point. Um, absolutely. If, if we're using online assessment for learning, um, then yes, you should you should probably add that feedback for the correct answer as well. So that's so that's every student gets the feedback regardless of whether they got the questions right or wrong. And then, as you mentioned, if they guess the right answer, that would provide an explanation at least for for where to get it or what way to get it in the textbook or what content it refers to. So that's a good point. I. I think that's a really good point. Cool. And then I had a question from Melvin. Melvin asks, in your feedback to students, um, do you provide badges or rewards for excellence? I personally haven't haven't done that, but um, I don't know if there's maybe some others in the in the chat room that maybe can share if they've done it. But I, I think it's a good practice, and I think it might be uh, motivating for students to to be rewarded in ways like that. Um, so kind of like a gamified whole module that's more kind of gamified in a way that you get certain badges for achieving certain things. Yeah, I know we have some folks in the room who have that interest. Uh, yeah, Myrtle says, enjoying your presentation, Anneli. Do you have an example of a journal rubric for use in a fully online course? Uh, short answer, not particular, not specifically, no. I don't have a specific rubric for an online course, but feel free to send me an email um, afterwards and then perhaps we can discuss the specific course that you're involved in and maybe I can see if I can um, can provide some assistance. Okay, awesome. And um, yeah, Nokatula said she's keen to learn more from Anneli around uh, sort of focus on un, on authentic and alternative forms of traditional assessment approaches. I think you've explained a bit of that, uh, you know, sort of through the different kinds of questions like the scenario question. Um, Osama had a, had a question around student performance um, and asks, do you think student performance in online assessment would differ much than in traditional assessment forms? Uh, example, paper-based. Considering the different writing skill challenges students feel in digital and non-digital environments. I think this is a question, uh, an interesting question, but definitely not a simple question to answer. And there's definitely not just one answer. Um, I think that it really depends on a lot of things. It depends on your discipline. It depends on the way that you ask your questions in an online environment. It depends on the way that you ask your questions in a traditional environment. 
if your traditional assessments only require students to remember or memorize the content, then it might very well be that they perform worse in some of your online assessment activities. Um, I might, um, I just maybe quickly can share one of one specific example that I've seen um, at our university with a lecturer that uses online assessment very effectively, um, where she allows students to do, um, she, she, she uses online practicals, uh, quizzes that, that's practical in nature, questions are practical in nature. And um, she asks, uh, she, they have to do six practicals over the course of a semester. And they used to do that on paper, but because she has such a large class, she just couldn't continue with that practice. So she was very worried in the beginning switching over to online because that she was worried that the students are going to perform too well in the online part and not really be prepared for the summative assessments. But quite the opposite was actually true. So she's been using online assessment now for about three or four years. I've worked with her um, and she's really mastered the, the technique or mastered the ability to, to set up very good uh, very good multiple choice type questions based on case studies, et cetera. And her average class performance for her first practical um, is usually the worst, the worst performance of, of the class. Um, and then they usually get better by the sixth practical, but then um, the same can be seen with the trend of her semester tests as well. So usually the, what she's seen basically over the past few years is that the online assessments has helped students to learn how to apply what they've learned in class so that they actually start performing better in the summative written traditional assessments. So basically short answer is that there is no short answer and that you, it really depends on, on, on your discipline and the way that you ask your questions in both formats. Interesting. So it's quite contextual is what you're, you're saying um, and discipline specific. So Myrtle had one around, um, and I know Myrtle's just left, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, she can always come back to the recording. Um, so she she commented around, oh, it was just a comment, um, and should, should we adhere to the same standards and rules um, as, face to, as assessment face-to-face? -face? So I guess she was actually more asking about what are your thoughts on that? Uh. Again, I think it depends on the type of assessment. So if it is a exam, a examination, then I definitely think that it needs to be in a more structured environment. It needs to be invigilated a bit um, and proctored in a way. Uh, so it, it kind of depends on the stakes of the assessment and the type of the assessment. But for, for formative types of assessment, whether you do this online or on paper, um, it's also, it probably also is, it's going to have similar rules. You're probably going to allow students after class to work, to work on assignments together that they submit. You're not going to know whether they work together, what resources they um, consulted, etc. Whether they submit that online or in paper doesn't really make a difference. So I guess in effect, yes, you're going to have the same rules for both online and paper, but definitely when it comes to a summative assessment, like an exam, um, there are definitely, I think, limitations to what we can do with online assessment. Cool. And then Libabala, I think you answered your own question, <laughs> which was around cheating. Would creation of question pools help counter this issue? When students take the test, questions are randomized from the pool and answers are, rand are randomized. Uh, so maybe you want to share your take on that, Anari? Yes, I'm really glad I, I actually got this question um, because this is actually something that I forgot to mention in the presentation as well. That is one way to reduce to reduce cheating is to um, have a question bank and randomize the questions. But you should be very careful um, when you use this method to not be unfair towards the student. So um, if you have a question bank, you should try and organize your question bank in terms of difficult questions, medium questions, easy questions, for instance, in terms of difficult level of difficulty, so that some students don't get all the difficult questions and some students get all the easy questions when it's randomized. Um, and that's kind of hard to do properly when you have a big question bank. But yes, one definite, one, one way to do it is to actually randomize the answers so that at least my option A is not your op option A. So that's, that's something you can do. But when you, when you want to start randomizing from a question pool, um, you, should be, you should take caution to make sure that it's not unfair towards some students. 
Awesome. So yeah, I think it's we're nearly we're three minutes from from two o'clock, and everyone's I can see a lot of a lot of thank yous. So again, also just from from Emerge Africa Network, thank you very much, uh, Anari, for presenting for us today, and a reminder to folks: please complete our a little evaluation form. Uh, it's useful feedback for Anari, but also for our network, and the kinds of events that we we would like to have in future. Yeah, so thank you everyone for joining us and maybe we've got a last question. Let me just checking the text chat. Yeah, it was a very, very informative session. A lot of thank yous. Um, and I'm very curious about Tia. Uh, and it looks like you're in a classroom and with the whole class of people who are, who are watching. So maybe you just want to say in the text chat where you where you guys are joining from. Um, we are at UJ and we are a meeting of 15 colleagues that belongs to a Southern African teaching and learning forum. And here we are, all of us. <laughs> Thank you, Anneli. That is just so great. So you've got your own local hub going at UJ. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that we, we love to see. And I know I had a lot of colleagues also joining from Rhodes. So I want to say thank you to the Rhodes colleagues as, as well. Um, and you know, people from across the continent. And if you want to do this kind of thing, like UJ is really, I think, um, setting the bar here. So getting a group of folks together in a room, maybe this is something you can do in your context. Go for it. Okay, we want to quickly say we are here from South Africa, and uh, Mozambique, Malawi, Malawi, Malawi um, Eswatini, uh, Botswana, Lesotho, and Zimbabwe. Yeah. <laughs> That's where we're all from. Wow, that's Zambia. amazing. Sorry, and Zambia. 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 And different universities. That is amazing. So I hope you have found, um, you know, the sort of Emerge Africa vibe and, you know, where we do things useful. And please encourage your colleagues to join. I'm putting the link there, emergeafrica.net. It's completely free. Um, you just have to put in your email address and yeah, we'd like to continue the conversations and if you want to present something for us or you have a colleague who you think would be a good speaker, please let us know. Yes, we will do so. Thank you guys. Okay. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Part of it was to introduce all of us to this emerge Africa that some of you are very familiar with, but I recently discovered. And uh, we need to sign up for the for the news uh, what's the uh, what the newsletter news or the reminder. Yes. And actually what Anneli has is, is if you go to her website of you, they are really quite amazing. Um, okay, I'm gonna so mute our UJ colleagues. That the Gulf community funds to answer the question what happened with Peach Mark School in terms of learning and learning? Okay, bye everyone, have a great day, um, and thanks again to Anari. And we'll keep in touch on and keep unleashing the power of networks with Emerge Africa.